This is the art zone. This is the art zone. Welcome to Art Zone, a profile of art and artists in the Rockford area. In this episode, we'll speak with artist Matt Herbig. Then we'll visit Gary Carlson and view his collection of local works. Hi, I'm Doc Slavkowski, and this is the Art Zone. We're coming to you from J.R. Cortman Center for Design downtown in the heart of Rockford's cultural district. Because of his meticulous nature and attention to detail, Gary Carlson has been successful in the automobile business for more than 25 years. He applies these attributes to his art collection and furnishings in his home in an historic downtown neighborhood. His blending of contemporary art and classic 20th century antiques creates a sophisticated yet warm environment. We'll visit the Carlson residence for this Art Zone's profiles in collections. Former curator of the Rockford Art Museum, Peter Baldaya, said that Matt Herbig is probably one of the best artists working in Rockford today. Herbig has been reviewed in several national publications, including the new Art Examiner. On a beautiful fall day in Levings Park, we talked with this self-taught artist about his work and his Cortman Gallery exhibition entitled Reach Into Fear. Here now is that interview with Matt Herbig. It's a beautiful fall day and we're in Levings Park in southwest Rockford and we're talking with artist Matt Herbig. Matt, I'd like to ask you about your show Reach Into Fear at the Cortman Gallery. Can you tell us a little bit about the title? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think part of the, the title for me was that um, I've done shows in the past and they've had fear in the title. And um, it was always kind of a uh, fear against myself kind of a thing. And, uh, and I guess the idea was that um, this is more examining going into it, not being so scared of it and, and dealing with it maybe. And your work, uh, you're a self-taught self -taught artist. Yes, I am. Right? And explain how you got into the entire artistic lifestyle. Um, I, had, I had always been, um, when I was a child, I did a lot of art and did a lot of drawing and was real involved in that kind of thing. Um, as I got older, I turned more towards a written word and did more writing and, and more cre my creativity kind of went in that area. Um, and just at a point when I, I was living in Chicago at the time, and I, I'm from Rockford, but I had just moved back to Rockford, and um, oh, it was kind of a low time. It was kind of a bad time in my life and a lot of uh, kind of a changing period. And um, I don't know, I just started doing, I started working on visual arts. I'd always been in, interested in it. I think for a long time, I felt like I didn't have the talent or didn't, that wasn't my area. And um, for whatever reason, I think at that time I started uh, doing, uh, working in the visual arts on a real rudimentary level. Um, I think I've kind of come to believe over the years that um, I'm not really that much different than uh, kind of your southern self-taught artists that kind of go out in the driveway and God tells them to start making whirly gigs or something someday. Um, I think I was probably... Uh, um, not that humble that I thought that at the time. I thought it was kind of my idea. I think as I look back on it over time, I tend to think that probably the same thing happened to me, except um, that I didn't, I wasn't humble enough to think, oh, oh, I'm kind of supposed to do this. I kind of just thought, well, this is something I can do. Um, now, as I look back, I think that it was, I was kind of directed to start doing that. Well, you had mentioned there that there was like a, a, a period in life where there was like a struggle. Do you think that there is something to art coming out of uh, difficult times, or is that is is that kind of maybe almost a cliche to think in that? Um, I think it can be a cliche. I think I think it does happen. I think difficult times make us, at least me, um, closer to my emotions, closer to my feelings, closer to I think what 
you know, the core of what a lot of creative art is for me anyway. Um, I think I used to buy into that myth for a long time that you kind of had to be miserable and struggle and the tortured artist kind of thing. Um, I think as, as I have grown up a little bit and just gotten older and, and, um, and worked in the creative arts more, I think that's kind of a fallacy. I think um, that I can tap into just as much emotion and, and everything and not have to live a tortured life and have a fairly normal lifestyle and be fairly happy person. Um, but that maybe initially I needed, I needed that to, get, to push me to feel enough to be able to express it. Um, I think uh, part of it is um, that I, I guess to go back to go back to the idea that I'm kind of I, I think creative the creative experience for me is more of um, a channeling one of channeling energy or, or creativity from another source kind of um, and I think because because of that for a long time I was really perplexed that I painted these pictures and I would never really quite know where they were going or how they were going to end up or when they would stop or and I used to be real frustrated with that um, I've come to just kind of accept that that that's how I work on things um, I think because of that I tend to um, for the images they tend to um, build themselves over a long period of time so what was maybe the initial idea changes and I add stuff and then you have to go back and um, uh, I'm, I tend to be real interested in composition and so for everything you move you have to move other things so so um, the image the imagery kind of builds that way um, I think the imagery versus the frame part of it is that I like um, they're all behind glass and I like the idea that they're in their own world they're sealed back there and and that it's it's it I think it um, it's kind of, it has something to do with uh, taking my fear and taking a lot of the stuff that maybe I'm wrestling with and kind of preserving it. It's like, you know, taking the stuffed crocodile and you put it in a glass case and you can go up and you can look at it and you can pet it, but it's still scary, but it's, it's mummified kind of. And I think that's kind of what my art tends to be is taking a lot of the demons floating around in here in my head and, and putting them, you know, resolving them by presenting them and kind of the weight of the frame is kind of needed to keep them in there maybe. How do I want people to view my work is just to, to look at it and give it enough time to kind of soak in. Um, I think it's, my work tends to be from people I know that own pieces and my own experience with it is that um, it kind of unfolds over time. It's kind of initially kind of, eh, it kind of, some people don't kind of like it, but I think if you tend to, the, I guess the emotional resolution in the pieces, even as a viewer tends to come with looking at them, for a certain period of time over a course of time and kind of seeing a lot of things. There's also just a lot of physical details that um, I tend to be real compulsive about that nobody would notice unless you really live with something. I've had uh, a friend of mine had a painting for years and, and you know three years later came to me one day when I ran into him and said you know you know I was just looking at that piece and there's this figure and I never really noticed this whole thing that's going on over here. And I said yeah you know that 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 is and, and there's even there's even things I forget about. I'll see a painting that somebody has owned and think, God, you know, I don't, I don't remember a lot of that stuff. So I guess it's just, I mean, I, I really believe that um, it's communication kind of through me to other people and that I'm kind of a translator, but I don't know if uh, I have some control, but I wouldn't say that I have a lot of control a lot of times that, that oh, I sat down and I thought of this idea and then I want to communicate this and this is about the uh, Bulgarian problem or what, you know, something like that. I'm not, I can't be that specific. I basically just kind of flounder around and at some point it comes together and, and I either uh, kind of give up and leave it the way it is and say, okay, that's, I can deal with that or it's resolved in some way. I'd like to have it resolved. Okay, how about intellectual and academic criticism? You've been very fortunate actually to have your works reviewed in national publications, for instance, like the New Art Examiner. How do you react to that, uh, especially being that you don't come from an academic background? Mm -hmm. Do you feel these people are on target when they're criticizing or reviewing your work, I should say? Um, yeah, I, I think actually I've been really lucky in that I've had, I've had good critical response to my work generally in the, in the history of it. Um, I think that um, 
sometimes a lot of those people see things that I don't see. Uh, and I, and I, that used to kind of, I guess, bother me. Uh, I'm, I'm more reconciled to the fact that there's stuff in there that I don't know about. And if people see it, that's fine. Um, you know, in specific regard to the New Art Examiner article, I think um, that pretty much the person that wrote that review pretty much hit it right on the head and, I, and, and, and got, you know, summed it up pretty, as, certainly as good as I could, probably, probably much better than I could. Um, you know, it, it, there, is, there is that kind of odd thing where you, you have people that are in a very learned thing that, that um, reviewing something that, that is fairly self-taught, but, um, but that's happened with a lot of, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's my, it's my job to critique it it just for my own purposes for making it, but anything other than that, I think people can interpret it any way they wish. What would you say to a young person who's thinking about becoming an artist or knows he has that in them, but maybe is afraid to do it here? I think that, um, you know, I, th I think to do it, I mean, I think, uh, um, one of the, one of the biggest things I've come, I've come to realize as somebody who is self-taught, and has had big periods in my life where I thought, okay, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to get a job and I'm going to settle down. I'm going to give up this art stuff because it's a pain. And, and I'm going to get on with what, you know, my dad would want me to do or whatever the, the thing is that um, I need to do it. You know, I think, I think kind of going back to the Rockford School question, I think a lot of the people that are here and, and spend the time and energy to do art in Rockford, where to some degree there's maybe not that payoff. There's maybe not a ton of galleries. There's not somebody who's just going to come in and spend a lot of money on your work. Those people are people that they have to, they have to be creative. They have to do their artwork. Um, and that you can do that anywhere. Um, some people need to go to be in, a, re, a let's say, a more a larger art scene like New York or Chicago or L.A. or wherever that is. Um, that's appropriate for some people. And if, it's appropriate, if that's appropriate for some person, I think they should go do that. But I don't think people should be uh, think that they have to do that. If if you have that feeling, you can do that anywhere. Um, and I think, you know, one thing I've kind of come to believe about creative people in general, and, and getting a little older myself, is that attrition takes such a toll on people. So many people get to that point and they do give up, and they go work for their brother-in-law, putting on aluminum siding or whatever they do, and they just kind of leave that go you know they leave that part of their life go um and 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 maybe that's okay for some people for me personally i realize more and more that that just that's just not going to be for me that I, I can't i'm not a happy person if i'm not doing it and i and i struggle with it and i and i still go around and around with that question but i think um you know i would just say hang in there and do what do what you want to do one of the great things about being here is that you can be eccentric. You can do what you want to do. You don't have to um, follow the latest thing in the galleries to be noticed. You know, it's it's, um, and that's kind of nice. This is the art zone. This is the art zone. to the India Terrace Historic District just north of Beatty Park downtown and for our collections profile we're visiting the residence of Gary Carlson. Gary, tell us a little bit about generally about collecting because you have not only uh, art here in two dimension on the walls but you also have a lot of artifacts. Tell us about how you've gone about collecting and how long you have been collecting. Probably as long as I've owned 
my own home or my own department um, is when I started. Um, I've really been fortunate in my life, um, though I've never, I'm not an artist myself, um, many of my friends are. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one of my longest friends is Sarah Bell, and we've been good friends since um, kindergarten in grade school. And Sarah, of course, is very artistic, and uh, I've always appreciated the things that she's done. Um, we also, at the grade school that Sarah and I both attended, uh, Jackson School, not far from here, uh, we had a very good uh, art teacher at that school um, who I think taught me to appreciate a lot of art, different things. Um, I've always been interested in um, uh, buildings, architecture, old houses. Um, I really have always appreciated everything old, but some new things too. I have uh, contemporary art, I have old things. Let's talk about this setting, this house here. Tell us a little bit about it because this is very historic, uh, has a lot of historic significance, doesn't it? It's just, I mean, I really love this house. I mean, it's something that, um, it isn't just a house, it's just a place for me to live. I really like it because it, it's something very special. Uh, it's been, uh, it, the story goes, and, and I call it a story because we really can't document all of this, but um, the story goes that this house has been rebuilt three different times, um, dating back to 1854, when it was the uh, caretaker's and gardener's cottage for the main house that was just um, to the west of this one. Um, and then in 1903, uh, the Blakes of Blake Awning, um, that, and that company is still in business and the family still owns that business, um, their family bought this house and enlarged it uh, and made it uh, into a Victorian house. Um, and then in 1929, Frank Duell, who was a fine home builder in town, bought this house from the Blakes and enlarged it again and completely redesigned it, changed the floor plan even on the inside of the house. Um, and made it into an arts and crafts style home. Um, it is, I think, a testament to him. Uh, and you can go, or I can go down different parts, like for example, Harlem Boulevard, I can drive down that street and I can point out to you the houses on that street that um, uh, Frank Duell built because they are very distinctive. Um, and I think this is, a, this is just, a, this also is a very distinctive home. It isn't just a you know, four walls. Right. The house is almost kind of part of the whole collection in a way mm -hmm. because there are so many artistic uh, accoutrements in this house, like for instance the, the stained glass windows and doors, mm -hmm. uh, the fireplace, uh, the butler's pantry for instance, the kitchen. Right. How much of that did you, uh, did you restore all that? Were a lot of these things existing here? How much did you have to replace? It's sort of interesting. The, the house had, um, when I bought it, uh, the owner, it, it had fallen into such disrepair that the only people that would rent it were uh, kids um, uh, just out of high school and, and uh, uh, but they did not um, damage the, uh, the art glass doors and windows. Um, the woodwork, there's lots of natural woodwork in this house, the beams and the ceiling. Um, they had a, a, a dartboard over the fireplace um, but they didn't damage the fireplace. Um, the uh, wallpaper that is in this room is grass cloth and though I, re I replaced the grass cloth I put back up what they had before and really, the, the, they had not damaged the, the grass cloth. The only reason I replaced it was because it was so badly stained. Um, the butler's pantry cabinetry, um, that was still in very good shape. So they did, I, I think they appreciated the, the fine things that were in this house. And, and fortunate for me, um, they, they didn't uh, destroy them. I was able to, um, to save them. The other thing, too, is the geographic setting of this house is uh, enviable and somewhat spectacular being on the river and uh, off the park. Great place for fireworks. I know you mm -hmm. always do a, a big firework thing. Yeah, big but also because of its uh, strategic location downtown, did George and Barbara Bush stay here when he was vice president or there was something about that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I wasn't here. I was on vacation. Uh, it was in the summer and it would, it would have been the summer of uh, 1980 and he was campaigning, uh, of course, for Ronald Reagan at that, at that point. And, um, uh, Bush came here with uh, Jim Thompson and uh, Lynn Martin. Uh, they were speaking in the park at a big uh, Republican rally and the Secret Service came to my neighbor uh, because I was gone and he said we cannot really give you advance warning to this. We have to, you know, it was the day before. We need to use this house for um, security. Would it be alright if we used uh, your home to bring as our Secret Service headquarters? 
And uh, Dave said, well, I, I think that would probably be fine um, because I, was, I wasn't here and he couldn't get a hold of me. So um, anyway, that day, um, George Bush spoke in the park, uh, parked in the, the, his limousine, parked in the driveway. Um, I wasn't here, but uh, there was, when I came back, there were still um, packages of food and things. They, they didn't leave the house a mess by any means, but there were remnants here that, that they had been here. And I guess George did come into the house. Um, we, my friends kid and say that he used the bathroom. And then, of course, I said I you know, never want to touch the bathroom or anything. Uh, but anyway, that's, of course, not true. But uh, anyway, uh, he did, um, several months later, he sent me a photograph, an autographed photograph of the three, uh, of, well, of George Bush and Lynn Martin and Jim Thompson in the front yard. And he autographed and, and thanked me for letting him use my house. Now, even though this is an, an older home, a historic home, you still have, it has, still has a very contemporary feel and a very warm feeling. And it, you have an interesting blend here of, of works of art. I mean, you have contemporary things, uh, for instance, the piece over the fireplace here. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, that painting was done by um, Paul Pinzeroni. And um, he's actually the, the only artist I know personally who was, was able to uh, make his whole living being an artist. I mean, he was a professional artist. Um, that's all he did. He he's no longer does that, but he still paints, but he, he's a um, state policeman now. But anyway, um, he is, um, he's shown in several galleries in New York and Chicago, um, all over the country. Um, that, um, as a matter of fact, that piece was um, on the cover of, um, and I wish I could remember the name of the magazine, um, I got this um, piece, I, I, I bought a car from, um, I, of course, sell automobiles, and Paul and Becky had um, a car that they wanted to sell, and I bought the car from them and told them that whatever profit I made on selling the car, I would spend that on a piece of art uh, from them, and that's how I got this painting. Um, I sold their car and then and gave them the money back that I made on the car for this, this painting, and um, it's a real, you know, it's a, it's an interesting piece because everyone looks at it and gets something different out of it. You can see faces in it or rose petals in it. And, but it is, it's definitely the most contemporary piece of art that I have. And I have it in the most prominent place in the house, which, of course, is over the fireplace. And I think it's a beautiful, um, beautiful piece of work. I, re I really like it. It's one of my favorites. And then contrasting to that piece is the, looks like a very old piece here. The old frame. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that's a, that's a Belle Keith. Um, and Belle Keith was... Um, Keith Country Day School, um, she, the Keith family was a very prominent um, original family here in Rockford, um, old time money, et cetera. And she was, a, she was a very prominent artist here at that time. And in the uh, Rockford College collection, if, if you ever get a chance to see it, um, they have a, a several pieces of hers in that, that collection. And um, this is a very small uh, landscape, um, a coastal scene. And that piece I got in uh, my, the first house that I bought. It was up in the attic, um, and when as you see it, um, it, it's even in the original frame and everything. It's just the way I pulled it out of the attic. I mean, it, it is a beautiful piece. It's 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 it also is one of my favorites. I, and I even I love the frame that it's in. It's just perfect. On the same vein, uh, the um, paintings you have in the sun porch there that are done yeah. also by an older artist. Yeah, like her name was Kay Pierman, and I know nothing about her except that, and those um, little paintings were given to me by uh, another friend, and um, Kay Pierman was a neighbor of this friend, and um, either when she passed away, and I, once again, I'm not sure if she's still alive, um, but she's no longer in these, these friends scene. Uh, but anyway, when she moved away, she was just discarding these, these paintings, and um, uh, my friend grabbed them and has kept them all this time and, and didn't want them anymore, so he gave them to me, and I think they're just really neat little uh, oil paintings. So I, and I just got them, so I haven't even put them on the wall yet, but they will uh, eventually end up on the wall somewhere. And some of the other local artists that you have here? I have um, uh, Gary Hartsfield, um, Paul Pinzeroni, Becky Pinzeroni, um, Sarah Bell, um, David Hagney, who is an architect here in town, I have a real uh, interesting small detail um, uh, drawing of the Jackson Piano Building. Uh, and then I have um, a pen and ink drawing of this house that was given to me by my neighbor, Dave Van Pernis, who is, is another very fine artist. Um, 
he had a friend of his, Dan Blasco, draw a, a drawing of this house, and he gave that to me for um, my first Christmas in this house, and that's in the other room. And so, yeah, these are all in your den, so there's yes. kind of an architectural theme yes. to the artwork right. that's, yes. that's in the den. Exactly. Then you have the, uh, like, this piece. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Roman arch print, a um, uh, man by the name of uh, Kenning uh, is the artist on that piece, and um, I bought that in a local antique store. And this, the, the antique dealer that sold that uh, to me, um, had, this, he told me, oh, I, I just got it. I haven't looked up the artist or anything, um, but he sold it to me. And then about a week later, I went in and he tried to buy it back from me. So apparently he'd looked it up and realized that he'd sold it to me too inexpensively or whatever. But I wouldn't sell it back because I happened to really like it. And um, then a couple months later, I was in San Francisco traveling with some friends and um, we stopped into a print shop in downtown San Francisco, and this I saw on the wall this, the same print, uh, the same um, series, or the same print, uh, another uh, in the series. And I asked the, um, the man that owned the print shop, and he said that, well, that's a Kenning. He said, I, I collect those. And lo and behold, I looked, and he had a whole wall of them, different, you know, different pieces that this Kenning had done. Um, and then, as a matter of fact, in the movie The Towering Inferno, um, but that was about the same period that movie came out, and that same print is hanging on the wall. You'll see it um, in, I think it's the, the, the office of the manager that runs the building that ends up burning. He's talking to his office, and it's right behind his desk, the same print. So it's a, it's a beautiful print. Um, and the Bob Sunday piece here. Yeah, that's another, as a matter of fact, Gary Hartsfield um, gave that um, Robert Sunday uh, Raku uh, pot to me for uh, Christmas one year. Um, that's the only piece of Sunday that I have. It's interesting. I've, I've bought a few other pieces of it as gifts for other people, but um, that piece was a gift to me. It's, ni it's nice to have artistically sensitive friends. Oh, yeah, it? it's great. <laughs> I guess Building so. a collection. I, you know, I also have a piece that you obtained even from a flea market or something in the, that you know nothing about. But yeah, right. There's, a, there's a, uh, a, an interesting little... Um, uh, oil painting in the in the front hall that um, I picked up at a flea market, and it's another one that's it's in its original frame. I'd say it's from the probably from the twenties, um, and there's no artist signature on it or anything. But it's just a really neat uh, painting. It has a, it's a nude of a, a woman on a standing on a, in a storm and in the sea, and there are all these other nude bodies lying around her. It's just a it's a great piece. It's a real neat. How much of piece. what you collect do you? look at as an investment or do you buy things because you want them or yeah you know, i i don't think i have there isn't a piece here that i bought thinking that i it was an investment there's nothing it's just because i like it i i've just bought things um that i like and i want to hang on the wall i i've never um i've never done i've never bought anything as an investment as far as you know pieces of art or furniture what advice could you give to somebody who's just let's say putting together a household or wanting to collect art mm -hmm. what would you say to them well i really i guess the the key is buy things because really because you like them and take your time um i have things that um like for example the, the i have oriental rugs and um i like them because um they're just they're timeless i mean and you don't wear them out you um you know you can use them for years and if you don't like them you always roll them up and and buy something else and then years later bring them out and and roll them back out again and use them again um but i think if you buy things not so much because of price because you know the the price is, you can buy it cheaply or whatever you buy things because you really like it maybe it's um a little more expensive than you want to spend but if you really like it then you always get to live with it. I mean, you, if, you enjoy, if you're buying something because you like the price of it, that only feels good when you're paying for it. But then you got to live with it the rest of your life. But if you buy things and you're buying them because you really like them, uh, then you'll enjoy them forever. And that's, it seems like that's how you do, do this, that you, you buy these things with the intention that you are going to have them and show them and, and live with them. Forever. Oh, right, yeah. I mean, we joke with friends saying, well, as a matter of fact, several of the group of friends that I have will say, we're going to have great estate sales. You know, it'll be a great estate sale when we die. Thanks for watching The Art Zone. We hope you enjoyed this program. If you have any suggestions or comments, you can contact us at J.R. Cortman Center for Design downtown at 107 North Main. Our phone number is 968-0123. Once again, thanks for watching The Art Zone.
This is the art zone. This is the art zone. The Art Zone is funded by J.R. Cortman Center for Design, downtown Rockford. This is the Art Zone. This is the Art Zone.